Hello, everybody. Thanks for letting me be here. I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, so I heard that there is a robotics program that was launched today. And I've been studying robotics for probably over half of my life. So I thought I'd share a little bit of a passion of why I've been not giving up on robotics and I'll probably keep going for a long, long way. Uh, so the title is Robo Robots with a Belly Button. Hopefully you get to go through a little bit of the journey. I'm a little bit of an unusual roboticist. I didn't start out on the right way, which maybe many of you have and many of the young kids are now doing, which is through first robotics, tinkering with electronics, learning to code. I did none of that. I really started out playing tennis. And this is all I wanted to do all my life. That's it. Um, turns out, <laughs> when you bet on one thing, sometimes it doesn't work out. But I got injured so much. In college, at some point, I had to think of something else to do. Luckily, I loved math and physics. So I banked on it and said, OK, brainstorm. Tennis, math, physics, what can I do? <laughs> What I came up with was this. I came up with the idea of building a robotic tennis buddy for myself. Great idea. I could build great legs that can run around on a tennis court on the other side and has head and holds a tennis racket, smart enough to know to how to play tennis with me. On the day that I want to play really well, it would st stimulate me. On the day I'm just, you know, depressed, it would make sure that I win. Um, <laughs> but you know what? It turns out to be this journey is really long. And when I went from undergraduate robotics lab, where the professor didn't discourage me from going and doing this, and imagining in my head, one day I'll build a robot like this, something that will continue to help me not be on tennis, not, be, not just tennis, but beyond that. So I went to even grad school and then built this thing. Um, this is now, I was at Berkeley and then I went to MIT and I helped build this robot named Cog. Um, it still has a belly button if you look really carefully. I was building and aiming to build a robot with a belly button because that's all I knew. I knew that robot was supposed to look like us because Jetsons and Robocop and Star Wars taught me so. Um, but you know what? As I started building this, and I started to get more and more curious about how human brain works and, and how, what does it really mean to do robotics, and I wanted to apply myself differently, I started to think robotics a little bit differently and come to this picture. As you take the class of robotics, you might not be building a humanoid robot. You might not be learning how to build a precise little details of fingers or legs, but you will definitely be learning this. You'll be learning how to sense the world, and then use that information to think really carefully. And I heard a little questions related to machine learning earlier. And of course, then outcome. We have to take action, whether with the motors or some other way, to take action into the world, and then let it be, and then again sense what had happened. And that feedback loop, that's what makes robots robots. And you know, if you encapsulate that in a mechanical system, then it doesn't necessarily have to have a belly button or legs or arms or eyes. So that's how I view robotics, and that's how I have been really utilizing some of the expertise that I've learned in robotics into different ways. So here's something that you would definitely not say it's robotics. Well, with my definition, this is one of the simplest version of robotics. So it's a light switch. On the top, there's an occupancy sensor attached to it. This occupancy sensor knows when you come into the room, you know those conference rooms you walk in and the light turns on? And that part seems OK. You don't think it's magical. But it turns out to be pretty hard. So you have also experienced a failure case where you're sitting in and typing away and the light turns off. And you're like, crap, what's happening? So you know, it's thinking and then deciding, making decisions about when to turn off the light to be good about saving energy and also not be annoying, right? Now it's starting to get more complex, more than you might imagine from something on the wall. But that's the simplest type I would call robotics. Now you can go to the extreme. That's where I've been throughout the graduate school journey and then when I was a professor at Carnegie Mellon in the University of Washington. I just wanted to go in a rabbit hole as deep as possible in robotics. So I built this robotic device and specifically wanted to build a human body part that made human human, hand. 
well, belly button. Well, maybe it doesn't make human human. Um, anyway, so the hand is amazing, right? So somehow we were able to build this society because of this thing that we got. Um, so wanted to understand why it's so amazing. Can we build it? Can we replicate it in robotics? If you see how robotic hands are now, it's very disappointing still. It can barely carry and grab objects and then manipulate and move things around. And if you could spin like something in your hand, that's a journal paper right there, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so I built that, spending years figuring out how the bone shape should be, putting 30 motors in the form, squeezing them in, pushing the technology of motors, to, you know, pushing the technology in terms of sensors, sensing from the skin, sensing from the pool. The muscles have sensors too. And then using all this information to do this complex motion. Now on top of it, I wanted that to be controlled by human brain signals. So working with people with neurological disorders, having them, or people who had, you know, um, when the arm, uh, where they had amputation, um, having their brain think about moving the arm they can no longer move, I wanted this robot to move. So getting from different kind of sensor mechanisms in the people's brain or on the surface, um, and then taking the electrical signals, interpreting that, sending them into the 30 different motor signals, and then having fingers move. And that's where my research was. And then this is also really exciting, and then I'm sure because of all the things that we've done and all the graduate students that we've studied with, there are things that we made profound difference for the future of people's life, and that's exciting. But wanted to, you know, so the, throughout the spectrum of things, one of the things that really caught me, and then I continue to have it as my theme, and I want you to think about it as you think about robotics program too, is this sharing of robots and humans doing some tasks together. Ultimately, I mean, it's even from the beginning, when I wanted to build this tennis robot, I wanted to build it to help me, human. And really, robots are about how can we enhance humans to be able to do more, or you know, things that they lost how to do. So in this case, this is a prosthetic hand tying shoe. Now, here's an interesting problem. Should this hand have full machine learning, and the brain signal simply say, tie shoe? And then says, OK, I know exactly how to do everything. And then just go ahead and I recognize the shoe, recognize the shoestring, move all the joint you know, angles, and then do it. The brain didn't do much. Or should the brain do everything as we do it, right? We tie shoes with commanding all muscles individually to move individual fingers to tie shoe. Which one should we choose to do as we move forward in the world where robots are in our society working together? I don't have an answer for it, and it turns out it depends on who the user is. We've learned it in different ways, even from Nest product that we shipped, that what people ask for is different. Some people who are missing arm wanted to do everything on their own. Even if it took two years to learn it, they wanted to learn it themselves. Some said, you know what, I'm lazy. Please just do it for me. If that technology is so advanced, great. So, you know, I think that's the thing that I keep thinking about as I work for a company like Nest. Nest has a mission to really create a home that takes care of people inside it and the world around it. And that really hits me. I'm building robots to help people. And, okay, we built these robots from Nest. Um, for those of you who don't know about Nest too much, I'll give you a quick example of a thermostat. So the thermostat we build, most of the thermostat out there um, are things that you go in the room and then you move a you know, lever or turn it, and then the room temperature goes up, you leave the house, and then you forgot to turn it off while well, you're wasting energy. So next layer of technology came and then said, OK, programmable thermostat. So we program it and then know ahead of time when you're going to go out of, uh, out of the house, we'll turn it down. Well, it turns out you don't necessarily have a very predictable life every day. So we came up with a thermostat, which is not just loaded with, you know, with a temperature sensor, but occupancy sensor, light sensors, and all kinds of sensors jam-packed in there, knowing what status you might, be, you know, what status your house is in, what kind of things you might be doing, and making sure that we understand and partner with you how much energy you want to save because you touch it when you want certain things to change and then listen, and then make actions in terms of what temperature to make the house. 
It seems kind of simple, but turns out it's really a geek inside, and I used to say I'm the geek inside, um, sitting in there and making sure that you're comfortable and also at the same time saving energy. So we've done that and I kept innovating in people's homes through all kinds of different products. And throughout this, some of the things that's falling out that I love is that we're starting to help people. So using those robotic technology in homes, this is a guy named Derek. Uh, he, he was at work. He has Nest products in his house. And one day he received a notification. One of the devices that we built took action to let him know that there was a stranger or some movement that he doesn't usually see happening at his front door when he's at work. Turns out what he saw was his dad, who's a little bit uh, have a dementia, uh, roaming around not knowing what to do. So Derek was able to immediately take an action, call neighbor and said, my dad is at the door, can you actually help? And then was able to get grandpa in the right spot and he was able to get home correctly and thought, wow, it's so great. The device that we built that sensed, thought about it, took action, was able to help someone. Same thing here. This family had also Nest products, thermostats and smoke detectors, CO detectors, carbon monoxide detectors. What happened for this family was that, again, they were, um, they were outside of the house, and, then, um, and during, the time, the, during the day, they got a notification saying that their carbon monoxide level is getting high. But not only that, our smoke detector talked to our thermostat and said, hey, dude over there, um, maybe you are connected to furnace. You might be producing carbon monoxide, so can you turn it off? So by the time they were even home, those things were taken care of. And I think those kind of things that we can start to imagine doing in a house because we're sensing, because we're thinking, we're taking actions. That's what the core robotics is, even without the belly button. So this is, of course, where we want to get to, right? Like, we want to live in a house where there's a robot that you can order around and they, you don't have to cook anything, you don't have to clean dishes, and you don't have to do any of that. But, you know, I'm still okay myself building a robot or even maybe living in it for the time being. So as you go through robotics program and think about whenever you hear the robotics, try not to necessarily think about that thing with I'm the belly button. Let's send those people out. Think of something like this in your head, and then we're going to be on the same page, and we're going to be starting to really help a lot of people. Thank you very much.